I first want to thank uh, Karen uh, uh, for that kind introduction and for all the efforts that she's put in and Rachel Jones to organize this event. And I also want to thank uh, the uh, panelists. Uh, I'm not going to go through the names again, except to say that there's some of them are friends of mine and have been incredibly helpful and others are um, uh, others I don't even know and have been kind enough to uh, join this panel. So I'm very moved by that. But I ultimately think it's a tribute to uh, the person that is the focus of our uh, discussion today, which is Ernst, who is Ernst Frankel. Uh, I came across him in studying uh, the Weimar Republic in Nazi Germany. And when I thought I was going to write a book on Jewish lawyers in Nazi Germany, he really draw, drew uh, uh, my attention. Uh, let me give an example that on April 8 of 1933, uh, after the Nazis had taken power in response to an ordinance requiring Jewish lawyers to apply for readmission to the bar and to acknowledge the presently existing situation as legally binding, uh, Frankel uh, asked not for readmission, but continued admission, and then wrote, as for a statement that I acknowledge as legally binding, the provisions establishing temporary impediments to being a lawyer. I refuse because I do not recognize those provisions. Um, and I thought that someone who could uh, write a statement like that under those circumstances was certainly worthy of uh, inquiry. Uh, there have uh, been uh, long and uh, excellent studies of Ernst Frankel uh, in the past, most importantly uh, in the uh, Weimar Republic when he was a rising star in the labor union movement, social democratic lawyer. Uh, there uh, uh, were studies of him in post-World uh, War II Germany when he was uh, helped invent the field of political science in West Germany and uh, advanced the theory of democratic pluralism. But there was much less study of what Frankel did in what were really the most exciting and dramatic years of his career in Nazi Germany uh, between 1933 and 1938. Uh, he was a, a Jewish social democratic a lawyer who engaged in political representation of clients, who also was active in the anti-Nazi underground, and who also wrote the classic account of the Nazi legal political system, the dual state, which uh, the first draft of which he completed while he was in Nazi Germany. Uh, so there had not been studies of that until most recently, uh, Hensmeyer Henrich, who, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, is with us here today and wrote a wonderful study of, uh, of Ernst Frankel. My questions when I looked at Ernst Frankel was, what did he do? How did he do it? And if he really did what he appeared to have done at first glance, how did he survive? And that turned into a question and an inquiry about the nature of resistance to the Nazi regime. There's been studies of resistance to the Nazi regime uh, extensively, most importantly during World War II, when throughout Nazi occupied Europe, there were uh, people who rose up against this foreign oppressor. When within Nazi Germany, there was the plot to assassinate Hitler on July 20 of 1944, uh, organized by the elites, by the church and the military. But there'd been much less attention uh, to the um, uh, resistance against the Nazi regime before the war, at a time when Jews, social democrats, and communists were in fact uh, resisting the regime from positions of weakness um, at great threat to uh, their own uh, safety and lives. And uh, Ernst Frankel was uh, certainly one of those people. Uh, he uh, was able to continue to practice law in Nazi Germany. Uh, he was not disbarred despite what he wrote in that uh, application in April of 1933, uh, because he was a World War I veteran and World War I veterans were allowed to continue to practice. And in continuing to practice, he represented clients who were charged with uh, crimes such as treason, uh, membership in the social democratic or communist parties, which had been banned, or the distribution of illegal pamphlets. And in representing those clients, usually, uh, if not exclusively in the regular courts, he at times uh, obtained acquittals uh, 
Um, this was a uh, time uh, of representation of clients, which was very different from the representations that took place during the Weimar Republic, uh, a time when cases drew high publicity, when there was uh, political justice in terms of libel cases and, and criminal prosecutions and vigorous and active defenses against those uh, uh, charges against political defendants. Uh, it was a time when in non-political justice, there were sensational trials. Um, it was a time in which there was publicity uh, surrounding uh, cases, but that was not the nature of Nazi era justice. Uh, then there were political crimes, certainly, and they were prosecuted uh, aggressively. Uh, but someone like Frankel, and he was a rare uh, creature, there were few people like him, but he put on non-political defenses uh, to these political prosecutions. This was not like the Weimar Republic in which attorneys uh, were, came to the fore as stars. Uh, Frankel stood out uh, to the extent he stood out in part because he was so self-effacing. He was tactful, but he was not cowardly. He was tactful enough to know that he could never mention in court uh, the Nazis uh, having set the Reichstag fire uh, as our uh, colleague Ben Head has uh, written about. Uh, that he could not raise in court because that was too blatantly political. But he could, and he did challenge confessions obtained through Gestapo torture, and he did that on more than one occasion. Um, so uh, this was extremely courageous representation, at times effective representation, but not representation with publicity. And it was also obviously not with publicity that Frankel participated in the underground. Uh, he was able to take a unique position in participating in the underground because he was a lawyer, a member uh, of an independent profession, which was independent from the state. And it was also independent from the groups uh, of the small scattered resistance groups that uh, sprung up in early Nazi Germany. He probably had more contacts with more different resistance groups because of his role as a lawyer than anybody else that I could imagine. And from that, uh, taking advantage of that position, he was able to get reports abroad about Gestapo torture. He got his hands on one document written by Hitler and got that abroad. And he wrote underground pamphlets uh, against the regime. And in writing those pamphlets, he was in fact, under Nazi law, committing the exact same crime as many of the defendants whom he represented in court. Uh, in one of those pamphlets, in fact, was entitled, was titled, the point of illegal work. A pamphlet was, whose purpose was to arouse, uh, to rouse social democratic resistance against the regime. And uh, the third aspect of what uh, Frankel did uh, was to write his classic book, The Dual State, uh, which was the first full length and comprehensive analysis of the Nazi legal political system uh, in which he characterized the Nazi state as uh, having a dynamic tension and a dynamic interplay between arbitrary power on the one hand and the Nazified legal system on the other hand, or uh, one could say the Nazifying legal system on the other hand. Uh, in the English translation of the book, that the two uh, prongs of the dual state are uh, characterized as the prerogative state and the normative state. The prerogative state being the realm of arbitrary power and official violence against which citizens enjoyed no legal protection uh, and uh, an arbitrary power in which the Gestapo or the Nazi party could unilaterally at times set aside judicial decisions that it disliked, for example, taking acquitted defendants off to concentration camps. And on the other prong was the normative state. And this was the legal order uh, which included both traditional law and newly enacted Nazi law. Uh, this was the Nazified legal system, the Nazifying legal system, uh, and it was a legal system which the Gestapo could also uh, influence through its arbitrary power to politicize that legal system and to up, uh, end it. This dual state, uh, as I've said, was dynamic. It was not uh, static. Uh, the uh, 
Uh, prerogative state was the uh, state with arbitrary power that was leading the way. And the normative state was the Nazified and Nazifying legal system, which was playing catch up. The prerogative state reshaped the normative state in its image and transformed the whole legal political system. Uh, in Frankel's view, this dual state was the opposite of the rule of law. Uh, it is a misuse of Frankel's concept in my understanding of it to equate any part of his theory, uh, such as equating the normative state with the rule of law. The normative state in Frankel's view was not the rule of law. The normative state was the Nazi legal system based on inequality even if it might have, in the words of uh, Hensmeyer Henrich, uh, had uh, remnants uh, of the, um, of the, um, of the uh, predictability for commercial relationships, uh, which characterized the, uh, uh, the uh, former rule of law. I'm looking forward to the comments of uh, my fellow panelists uh, I uh, would just note in segueing into their comments uh, that Frankel wrote the dual state in thinking about Nazi Germany. He was not thinking about applying a larger political uh, theory uh, to other uh, circumstances. Uh, I uh, think uh, it is, will be interesting to see uh, from the comments of the panelists um, how uh, they view uh, Frankel's view of the dual state as uh, appropriately uh, under, uh, an appropriate approach to understanding the Nazi legal political system on the one hand, and uh, whether it is in fact a valuable uh, theory and approach for understanding other authoritarian regimes as well. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you very much, Douglas. Uh, that was very uh, helpful to, for us to start uh, our discussion today. And next we're going to have uh, to ask uh, Professor David Dysonhaus to speak and he will speak about dilemmas human rights lawyers face in unjust regimes uh, with examples from the Israeli occupation and South Africa. Thank you, David. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Karen, for organizing this. Thank you all for being here. It might be a product of the times that we live in, but I actually find it uh, quite moving to see so many old friends uh, gathered together and some people I've only learned to know over email. And uh, last of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Douglas, for writing this wonderful book. I've been interested in Frankel for uh, many years and uh, Jens has uh, done amazing work in bringing Frankel back to our attention, but what was missing was an account of Frankel's legal practice, and you've given us that, and I think it's extremely valuable. And I'm actually going to uh, pick up on where you left off, uh, Douglas, because as many of you know, but as others will be able to tell from my accent, I, while I teach in Canada, I come from South Africa. I'm actually speaking to you, not from Canada now, but from uh, Oxford. So just down the road or up the road uh, from Yens. And uh, from my earliest time thinking about uh, the law, as a law student in apartheid South Africa, I've been fascinated by the way in which uh, law can be used, as I like to think of it, uh, to resist law. And the, the most important figure for me in uh, thinking about these issues is an Afrikaner lawyer of whom some of you might have heard, uh, called Bram Fischer. Uh, F Fischer was born into what uh, the, equ the equivalent of an aristocratic Afrikaner family, uh, but he became a communist and also became South Africa's uh, leading uh, advocate or, or barrister. And he uh, did most of the uh, important political work in the 1950s and early 1960s, including representing uh, Mandela at the trial which uh, resulted in Mandela's uh, life imprisonment. The, 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 there is some commonality between uh, Fisher and, uh, and Frankel, not only in their Marxism, although I think that uh, Fisher was uh, much further on the left uh, than uh, Frankel, uh, but, but also in the way that they uh, 
uh, played both sides of the fence, as it were, because all the time, or at least from the late 1950s into the 1960s, Fisher was also involved in underground activities and eventually went underground himself. And uh, when he was uh, caught and imprisoned, yeah, he was sentenced to life and spent effectively the rest of his life in prison. He made the decision, as he uh, made clear in various uh, letters to uh, the court, to go underground, because although he had a fierce hope for law, he believed that at the time that he went underground in the early 1960s, something like the prerogative state had come to uh, rule in uh, South Africa. And so he didn't think there was much point in carrying on with uh, the kind of lawyering that he had engaged in up until then. Now, I think it's very interesting that uh, Mandela, in his uh, autobiography, says that Fisher made a grave mistake in going underground. Uh, Mandela said it would have been far better if, as I think he puts it, this hero of uh, the Afrikaner people had continued uh, the legal struggle without uh, dabbling in underground activity. And th th there is a, a, an interesting aftermath to the story because uh, Fisher's uh, torch was picked up, as it were, by a group of uh, young human rights lawyers, including Arthur Chaskelson, who became the first Chief Justice of uh, post-apartheid South Africa, the head of the Constitutional Court. And they kept alive, these lawyers, an understanding of the rule of law and its worth during even the worst times of apartheid, something that Jens has written very effectively about in his book about uh, South Africa and path dependence of uh, the rule of law. And it does seem to me that there's a big difference between the conditions under which these uh, South African human rights lawyers worked and the conditions under which Frankel worked, which made uh, Frankel all the more admirable. And in my own work, and this is work I've prepared for a conference that Jens organized a while ago, so this comes from a paper that Jens has seen and John Firajon has seen, I've tried to work out what, what the contours are of uh, this kind of legal struggle. And uh, I developed the, what I think of as ideal types of state, one of them being the apartheid state. And what was, what, what was peculiar about the apartheid legal state was that even through the worst times of apartheid, the idea that all South Africans, including the black majority were equal be before the law uh, was kept alive. Even though South uh, black South Africans were discriminated against in vast areas of their life, Still, there was this idea that everyone was equal before the law. And I contrast that uh, uh, state, the apartheid state, with the dual state, where, as, uh, as Frankel effectively shows and Douglas uh, highlights in his work, uh, there wasn't this uh, ideal of uh, the equality of all before the law. In fact, uh, things were much worse because, on the one hand, there was a prerogative state, which was really a lawless state. Next to it was uh, the normative state. And the space available for legal struggle in the normative state got ever more constricted as the prerogative state uh, developed. So it was under really severe conditions that Frankel managed to achieve the victories uh, which he did achieve. And uh, this, I think, uh, testifies even more powerfully to uh, the power of law to be used to resist law than uh, uh, one can get from the example of the apartheid state. I think I've probably used up almost all of my time. I just want to say one word about uh, the state where uh, Hassan and uh, Rini are uh, now sitting, which I have called in my work uh, a parallel state. And I find that I think the parallel state is fascinating because what one has, as I understand it, is uh, on the one hand, the Israeli legal order. On the other hand, uh, the legal order that prevails in the occupied territories. These states are unified legally by uh, the Supreme Court, uh, which sits at the top of uh, these two parallel orders. But to a large extent, uh, uh, those who staff uh, the institutions of the Israeli legal order try to prevent the principles that animate the Israeli legal order from reaching into uh, the uh, uh, Palestinian uh, legal order. And that means, as uh, Hassan very effectively explained to a class of mine, which he attended, I think in uh, December of last year, that means that when someone like Hassan is litigating, uh, he has to litigate under two, uh, under very different conditions 
if he's litigating in the space of the Israeli legal order, he can call on uh, Israeli constitutional law. But if he moves to uh, the Palestinian legal order, there he has to have recourse to international law because the constitutional principles of the Israeli legal order do not govern what happens in the occupied territories, except insofar as uh, the settlers are concerned. But still, that gives a human rights lawyer, as I understand it, like Hassan, some kind of traction in uh, both legal orders because he can depend on uh, fundamental legal principles, although these uh, differ from legal order uh, to legal order. Whereas Frankel had uh, no such uh, recourse, which again, uh, just to uh, repeat what I said earlier, I think makes his work uh, all the more admirable. And I think I'll uh, end there. Thank you very much, David. Uh, before we move on, I wanna uh, remind everybody that first of all, we would like you to turn on your videos, keep your microphone muted until you speak, but do turn on your videos if you can so that we see you and you're with us. The other thing is I wanna remind everybody that you can um, write questions or comments in the chat or already raise your hand in the raise hand function if you want to speak later in the discussion. And we're moving on to uh, Professor Lawrence Douglas, who will speak about the normative state or prerogative state, the case of SS courts. Thank you, Professor Douglas. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for organizing this again. Thanks uh, for, to Douglas for uh, writing the book. Um, I recall that uh, during my first year of law school, I read an article uh, by uh, Herbert Packer, and this article was called um, Two Models of the uh, Criminal Process. And in it, uh, Packer described uh, two distinct approaches to determining uh, the culpability of uh, persons accused of criminal wrongdoing. Um, the first model he called uh, the due process model, and this is based on the formal presumption of innocence and it placed many obstacles uh, in the way of the state's uh, path of uh, proven guilt. Uh, he called the second model, uh, the crime control model. And this was based on the uh, factual presumption of guilt. And it relied on uh, very streamlined procedures that permitted the state to move uh, rather expeditiously from um, accusation uh, to conviction. And I was uh, reminded of uh, Packard's article when I read uh, Douglas's account of the dual state. And I should say that not because uh, I think Packard's due process model uh, tracks Frankel's uh, notion of normative state or that uh, Packard's crime control model uh, tracks uh, Frankel's idea of the prerogative state. Um, but uh, Douglas's book put me in the mind of uh, Packard's discussion uh, for uh, a different reason. Uh, for Packer, both of these models, these uh, due process and crime control models, uh, were in his mind ideal types in the Weberian sense. Uh, so no one system is ever entirely dedicated uh, to the due process model, uh, nor does any system ever um, have all the features of this crime control model. Uh, instead, uh, Packer observed that any given system will have aspects of each. Uh, for example, in a liberal system, the due process model uh, will predominate in an authoritarian system. Uh, the crime control model predominates. It's really an all a matter of a uh, mix. And, uh, and this kind of uh, picks up on um, what Douglas said in his opening remarks, because I found myself wondering when I read his book, um, whether we can say the same about the normative state and the prerogative state. Um, Frankel appears to be arguing that the, not, that the uh, Nazi state was uh, somewhat um, unusual in having this uh, dual aspect. And I should probably emphasize that I'm coming to Frankel uh, via Douglas and Jens, uh, because I have to confess that I actually haven't yet read the dual state uh, myself. But it does strike me that what um, Frankel described as kind of a distinctive quality of the Nazi state uh, might actually be said to ca characterize uh, all states. Uh, that is, all states perhaps can be characterized as part normative and uh, part uh, prerogative. Um, and here, parenthetically, I, I wonder about the designation uh, that Frankel used of normative. As Douglas makes clear, uh, for Frankel, the normative state really didn't need to have any normative content in any meaningful sense of that word. 
Uh, and I was wondering if maybe Frankel might have been better served had he used a uh, normatively neutral term such as the juridical state. Um, in any case, it struck me that uh, the normative and prerogative states are uh, perhaps to be understood as ideal types by which any given state can be described in terms of the relative mix or predominance of one aspect or uh, the other. Uh, I don't think you necessarily need to be a, a Schmidian to recognize that even the most liberal constitutional order uh, will have features of a prerogative state. And uh, conversely, even the most arbitrary of regimes will uh, have aspects of a juridical or normative state. Um, I was also left wondering about the relationship uh, between law and these uh, two types of states, obviously a pretty central uh, issue. Uh, it strikes me that uh, Frankl associates a lawfulness with the normative state, even if the law of the normative state lacks, as we've said, any normative content. And conversely, uh, the prerogative state appears to be associated with uh, lawlessness, uh, even if the content of these prerogatives might at least theoretically uh, be normatively neutral or suppose in some ideal typical way, even attractive. Um, in the context of the Nazi state, I think we can say that things really were uh, quite muddled as uh, Douglas makes clear. Um, consider uh, Hitler's directive of October 1939, which authorized uh, the killing of those suffering from uh, mental and physical uh, disabilities. Um, in a recent book called uh, Reckonings, the prominent uh, uh, British historian, uh, Mary Fulbrook, uh, she observed that Hitler's directive was, and this is her language, was never legalized. It only had the force of Hitler's personal order, not the force of law. Uh, but of course, this raises the question of what does the force of law mean in the context of such a state? Uh, certainly, there are plenty of German uh, scholars of the law of the Third Reich um, who have argued that the will of the Fuhrer indeed had the force of law, uh, regardless of whether it was issued in written or oral form uh, or even in the form of a secret order. Now, Fulbrook. Uh, um, insists that uh, Hitler's order um, could not be understood as lawful uh, because it was never, and again, this is her language, translated into legislation. But again, I think raises the question of what, what does that mean? Uh, Hitler's Germany had no functioning legislature uh, and indeed invested a legislative process directly uh, in the hands of the executive. And so in a sense, to contrast Nazi legislation with a uh, Hitler's secret order uh, or an oral command is uh, supposed to offer a, a distinction without a difference. And I think the debate's hardly academic because it goes to the heart of the question of whether post-war German courts uh, would be able to charge former Nazi perpetrators of violating law that was operative at the time. And uh, I suppose this is the question that preoccupied uh, Gustav Radboch. Uh, that is the question of retrospective judgment, uh, which strikes me as quite different than the question of contemporaneous resistance, which uh, Douglas points out uh, preoccupied uh, Frankel, at least in part. Uh, and whether successful or not, Radbruch uh, at least has sought, he at least sought to uh, break from a, a kind of uh, legalistic binary, um, which saw that either Nazi atrocities were lawful at the time, uh, in which case uh, post-war punishment in German courts uh, would be barred, or they were criminal at the time, in which case uh, post-war punishment uh, would be permissible. And I, I think maybe one way to um, characterize Radbrook's uh, radical claim was to insist that the uh, actions at the time were lawful, and yet retrospective punishment nonetheless remains uh, permissible. Let me just uh, conclude with a case that maybe illustrates some of these uh, vexing issues. So uh, this case uh, perhaps illustrates how SS courts handled the question of whether the mass killing of Jews was lawful in the Third Reich. Now, the fact that the SS did have their own courts, of course, is a fact not to be uh, forgotten. And at least some SS judges, uh, such as um, Conrad Morgan, uh, they actually saw themselves as 
you know, scrupulous upholders of SS law, um, that is of kind of agents of a normative state, even again, if those norms were uh, utterly deformed. And uh, so in applying the then operative German law of murder, uh, SS judges recognized three acceptable or lawful uh, forms of killing. And these were euthanasia killings, uh, executions at concentration camps, and the uh, officially decreed extermination of Jews. So none of these acts uh, constituted uh, punishable offenses under uh, SS law. Um, and so while herding Jews into gas chambers or shooting them in mass graves uh, was lawful conduct, shooting Jews for sport uh, was not. Uh, and on uh, May 24th, 1943, uh, Max Teubner, a, a lieutenant in the SS, uh, he was convicted of engaging in precisely this kind of a uh, sport killing. And the SS court insisted that in killing for sport, uh, Teubner had violated the German way of conducting the quote, necessary extermination of the worst uh, enemy of our people. And yet, uh, interestingly, uh, the court did not find Teubner guilty of murder. Uh, instead, uh, Teubner's offense was pre breach of troop discipline. Um, and this handling of the case actually became a characteristic of the way SS courts treated the unauthorized killing of Jews, that is not as murder or as a manslaughter, but as acts of disobedience or lack of discipline. Uh, Teubner was convicted and he served a year in prison. And in a fitting footnote to the case, a uh, post-war German court uh, concluded that Teubner could not be retried for his blood sport hunting of Jews because of the bar against double jeopardy. And uh, in this way, uh, post-war German courts treated the verdicts of SS courts as legitimate juridical pronouncements, or perhaps to use uh, Frankel's concept as a valid act of the normative state. So I think I'll uh, stop right there and um, look forward to hearing the other comments. Thank you very, very much, Lawrence. Um, next we'll have uh, Professor Benjamin Hett and his uh, presentation will be, is titled Witness, Advocate, Victim, Analyst, how well do these roles go together? Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Let me just really quickly add my thanks, um, first of all, to Douglas for writing such a terrific book and also for inviting me. And thank you also to the organizers for inviting me to be here today. It's really a delight and an honor uh, to be here with so many distinguished colleagues and, and old friends. So when I was thinking about what I should talk about here, I thought probably the thing that would make the most sense would be if I said a little bit about where uh, my work has intersected a bit with Ernst Frankel. And it's not a big intersection, but I think it, it, it does raise um, an interesting issue, all the more interesting for the fact that Douglas himself, to an extent, makes it a theme throughout his book. The fact that Frankel was a guy who bore a lot of different roles, uh, as, uh, as my, my sort of title indicates, uh, someone who was obviously an advocate in dangerous circumstances in Nazi Germany, a victim of Nazi oppression, um, uh, and then you know later an analyst and a scholar of, of Nazi Germany and how its law worked. Um, and there, there may be tensions between these roles, and in any case, sometimes the different aspects of the roles very much get instrumentalized in debates about Nazi Germany, both by, well, by people on various sides of the debates. And in a sense, this is where Frankel entered the story of something I wrote about, which was the Reichstag fire. And so I thought I would say just a little bit um, about that. Um, so let me just uh, really quickly say a couple words about the Reichstag fire for people who might not be so familiar with it and its debate. Um, I like to say that the debate over the Reichstag fire is kind of the John F. Kennedy assassination of German history um, in the sense that there's something that we know happened. Um, a fire destroyed the plenary chamber of the Reichstag, Germany's parliament in Berlin, 
on the evening of the 27th of February, 1933. And we know that the following morning, um, Hitler, uh, who was only four weeks into his role as chancellor, got Reich President von Hindenburg to agree to issue a decree, the famous Reichstag Fire Decree, which really tore the heart out of the Weimar Constitution, a document which, as Douglas points out, Frankel himself called uh, really the Constitutional Charter of the Third Reich. What remains a source of argument is who actually set the fire. Um, the Nazis claimed it was a communist uh, coup attempt. That's the one theory that no one today still sticks to. The other possibilities are that, and this is where it's a little JFK-like, the other possibilities are that a lone Dutch anarcho-syndicalist, um, a little bit mentally handicapped and very much visually handicapped named Marinus van der Lubbe, snuck into the building and set the fire by himself. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that the Nazis did it, most likely through a squad of stormtroopers, precisely so that they could have the pretext to pass their decree. And that debate um, goes on to this day. Uh, the debate really started to pick up steam in the late 1950s and 1960s. Um, and there's an interesting element to the debate, especially in those early, relatively early days of it, and especially in West Germany. And that is that it wasn't random who argued one position or the other. If you look at the debate, it very clearly breaks down that people who argued that the Nazis had set the fire themselves were pretty much without exception people who had been victims of the Nazis or and or resistance fighters. Um, they, they tended to be Jews, especially Jews who had been emigres, like Frankel, uh, or they were non-Jewish resistance fighters like the memoirist Hans Bernd Gazavius, who was um, connected to the July 20th resistance and later wrote about the fire. Um, the people on the other side, the people who said that Marinus van der Lubbe had done it himself, were again, virtually without exception, either uh, former Nazi perpetrators or representatives of former Nazi perpetrators or in some way advocates for former Nazi perpetrators. Which brings me just very briefly to mention a man named Fritz Tobias, who became the most prominent and most influential advocate of the idea that uh, van der Lubbe had burned the Reichstag by himself. Uh, Fritz Tobias was actually an intelligence officer with the entity which in German has a very long name, which translates roughly as the Office for the Protection of the Constitution. It's the Domestic Security Service. In his spare time, Fritz Tobias wrote history, or maybe not so much in his spare time because there was actually, it has now been shown a bit of an intelligence uh, agenda to his historical work, but that's, I'll leave that aside for now. In any case, Fritz Tobias uh, strongly advocated that van der Lubbe had acted alone. And then he became a central figure in a controversy really from uh, the very beginning of the 1960s until his death in 2000, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2011, which had very much the element of a debate between ex-Nazis or apologists for ex-Nazis versus victims and resistance fighters. And it's sort of in this context that he came into correspondence with Ernst Frankel in 1971. And Douglas refers a little bit to this correspondence in his book. I want to come back to it because it does raise squarely the position of sort of who legitimately, legitimately gets to speak about something like this and what is the position of your argument. Um, Frankel used his position as a witness and an advocate to strengthen his own interpretation of the Reichstag fire. And Frankel was absolutely convinced that the Nazis had done it. Um, in one of his letters to Tobias in 1971, he told of how one day he had gotten into the courtroom uh, where van der Lubbe was on trial in late 1933, and he had watched the proceedings for an hour or so. And from careful observation of van der Lubbe, uh, Frankel wrote, and here I'm quoting, no one could convince me, me is in all caps, that this man was not drugged. No one could convince me that this pile of misery had set fire to the Reichstag without any help and support. Um, Frankel also, in these letters, referred to his work as a defense attorney in the years from 1933 to 1938. Uh, and as Douglas discusses, he specifically mentioned the case of the Quaker and pacifist Emil Fuchs, who had dared to claim that the Nazis had burned the Reichstag. Um, in this case, uh, wrote Frankel, and here quoting again, like in a thousand other cases, I let the prosecutor explain to me that, 
God preserve us, the Nazis had not burned the Reichstag, and I had to keep my trap shut. And I said everything else conceivable. There was just the one thing I couldn't say and didn't say. Since then, Mr. Ministerial Counselor, he was very polite, um, I have been allergic to someone complaining that the Nazis did not set fire to the Reichstag. And I think about the poor guys who were beaten, arrested, and punished for saying what everyone back then said who wasn't completely morally corrupted. The end of quote. Frankel also wrote that he would not be able to look his former clients in the eye if he did not reject what he called Tobias's false teaching about van der Lubbe acting alone. Well, now, what did the other side say? And it may not surprise you if I say they just flipped the argument right around. If you were a witness, still more if you were a victim of the Nazis or an emigre, there's no way you could be objective and scholarly about the fire. Um, those familiar with the historiography of the Holocaust will know that the same issue has cropped up there, not, not coincidentally, I think. Um, a good example of the approach is in the work of the political scientist Eckhart Yesse, who wrote extensively about Vergangenheitsbewältigung, or coming to terms with the past and the Reichstag fire, both together, very much on the side of Fritz Tobias. Um, using as examples prominent emigres like Robert Kempner and Golo Mann, Yessa made an explicit connection between being a victim of the Nazis and bearing a corresponding lack of ob objectivity about the Reichstag fire. Because they had been forced to emigrate after the fire, Kempner and Mann were, quote, fixated on its dreadful consequences, unquote, and thus rendered incapable of any judgment, sine ira et studio in Latin, coolly and objectively. But this, again quoting, emotional dimension understandable for many emigres could not release a scholar from the duty of sober and unbiased judgment to allow free reign to emotionalization, fantasies, anxieties, and speculations would, according to Yessa, spell the end of all scholarship. Um, and Tobias himself said very similar things. On one occasion, for instance, quoting the first chief of Hitler's Gestapo, Rudolf Diels, who, as Tobias wrote, had mocked the emigres for, quote, falling with almost sensual lust on the Reichstag fire as a subject, close quote. Um, now, the thing is, I don't want to say that there aren't legitimate questions to keep in mind when a witness to an event or a victim of that event becomes a historical chronicler. Obviously, there are subtle aspects of perspective and judgment that come into this. One time I had a very interesting experience in one of my classes at Hunter College where I was teaching sort of the debate over who gets to write about the Holocaust, and I was trying to make the pitch that it's really illegitimate to disqualify you know, victims from scholarship because they're too emotional about it when you don't also do that with the perpetrator side. And a young woman of Cambodian background actually put up her hand and made a really interesting point. And she said, the year before she had been trying to write a paper about the Cambodian genocide and her mother drove her crazy because her mother kept intervening and saying, well, you've got to write it like this. I was there, I know. And the student said to me, I'm just trying to write an objective paper and my mother keeps bringing in her victim perspective. So I thought that was actually a kind of interesting sidelight on all this. Um, but it, it is in any case, an interesting problem. And again, one that comes up, I think more squarely with Ernst Frankel than anybody or almost anybody comparable in the whole sort of spectrum of Nazi Germany. Very few people played as many roles as he did. And Douglas shows us really effectively um, the extent to which the arguments of the dual state really come out of his experience of legal practice. And in some ways, that is a strength. In some ways, that really, I think, puts a, you know exclamation mark on the arguments. But in some ways, uh, that may open it up to at least legit more legitimate versions of the kinds of criticisms that uh, Fritz Tobias might sometimes make of uh, victims or emigres writing about uh, the Reichstag fire. So I think I think I've pretty much uh, run my time out. So I will uh, I will leave it at that. Again, um, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, sharing more in this discussion. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, I'd like now to invite Hassan Jabarin, uh, who will speak about the impossibility of the dual state in ethnic hierarchical regimes the case of the Palestinian citizens before the Israeli Supreme Court. Hassan, thank you. Hi, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Douglas, for the amazing book, uh, one of the books that uh, 
if you start to read it, you cannot leave it. This is what have it with me. Um, and uh, I want to refer to your question whether we can use the dual state concept as model, as a theory that uh, allow us to understand another regimes. Uh, to reveal a secret, when I got the invitation from Karen and I read immediately the book, I was in writing article for a journal of Tel Aviv University about uh, the <coughs> a period of the military regime applied to the Palestinian cities of Israel since 1948 to 1966. And immediately I found how much the dual state could be as a model relevant theory to understand that regime there. And uh, I am happy that also Tel Aviv University itself uh, uh, didn't uh, see uh, <coughs> that uh, to refer to the book itself or to the theory as a political problem for Tel Aviv University especially when we are not comparing to the Nazi regime, but speaking about the theory and the model itself. So the dual state, we can understand that uh, any regime that can apply two different tracks to two different groups, one track could be derogative and the other normative law, and one administrative law only, and the other could be administrative law and constitutional protection. One a group could enjoy only the limits of emergency regulations, the other could enjoy also constitutional protection. So this dual state can be seen, and this is how uh, I refer to it, as a state that manage two different tracks to two different or two separate, two separate groups. Now, David, they refer to the distinction between uh, West Bank and uh, the Green Line in Israel, with the Palestinian live in the West Bank and the Palestinian live in Israel. Yes, in the Palestinians who live in the West Bank, we can speak clearly as Israel apply their strict dual state, strict to separate legal uh, 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 regimes. One that applied to the Palestinians, which is the bureaucratic state, and one applied to the Israeli settlers who live there, that they enjoy Israeli constitutional protection. And the distinction between the two separate tracks is so clear. The Palestinian cannot enter the law that applied to the Israelis, and the emergency regulation that apply to the Palestinian live in West Bank cannot apply and are not applied to the Israeli settlers. Now, what is the case of the Palestinian citizen of Israel? The Palestinian citizen of Israel uh, has different cases. They are living under Israeli law, and this, these Israeli laws apply to the Israeli Jews and to the Israeli Palestinians. But at the same time, Israel defined itself as a Jewish state and exclude the Palestinians. So here, in the case of the Palestinian citizen can be clear, close to the interaction that speak about the uh, Frankel between the bureaucratic state and the normative state, that there is no clear cut between the two tracks. Sometimes you are entering the normative state and you end with the bureaucratic state. You as a lawyer start with one track, but in the end you might end with another track. Now here, uh, I refer to the era, the period of the uh, military regime that applied to the Palestinian citizen of Israel. A military regime uh, was applied since uh, uh, 1948 until 1966. Mm -hmm. Now, the Palestinian citizens also part of Israel law, Israel law applied to them. But at the same time, Israel put them under military regime. 
What's that mean, military regime? That apply to them the emergency regulations in their villages. Israel can put, uh, put them and the villages under closure. You cannot leave the village without permit. And the emergency regulation limit any political activities. But at the same time, you as Palestinian can enjoy the normative state. If you, for example, got the permit to leave your village to Tel Aviv and to join the Jewish market, you will enjoy all the labor laws applied to you. So all the time you carry with you those two different regimes, the permit regimes and the same time the Israeli law. Now, the interplay, the inter connection and the dynamic habit in cases when the Palestinian lawyers try to enter the normative regime in political right cases. Now, political right cases always they were under the military regime. What will happen with the case that they try to ask that also uh, that they allow to enjoy Israeli constitutional protection as the Israeli Jews enjoy it. There is no law prohibited. Now, here where my article referred to a political movement called the Ard movement. The Ard movement, small nationalist group uh, led by a number of law students that they study and learn in Hebrew University in the law schools in the early 60s, 1960s. And in order to manage political activities, their political activities, they knew that they have to escape the emergency law track and to enter the normative law track. So how to do it? One of the creativity of them was to ask to register themselves as business company. If you enter the business law, you will enjoy what the business law can provide for you. So the registrar of the company refused to register them. And he claimed that he has absolute power not to register any company if he found that there is security reason to prohibit that. Why security reason? Because they are national, they have a national agenda, but legal agenda, it's not entering the criminality. So they filed petition to Israeli Supreme Court and Israeli Supreme Court accepted their petition. And this case consider one of the landmark cases in the right of association in Israel law. The court say, well, they want to register themselves as a company. And the registrar doesn't have the authority to use security reasons. Security reasons belong to the security tracks, to emergency regulations. So he didn't use his discretion uh, properly. And by this, they won the case and consider today one of the most landmark cases, which I challenge. But what the Supreme Court say also, the Supreme Court say, well, we look to their goals as company. They say that they want to issue books through the company. They want to issue newspapers through the company. Well, if they want to issue books, the state can use emergency regulation and prohibit them to issue books. If they want to issue newspaper, the state can prohibit them through emergency regulations to issue. So let us register them. So from a formal uh, aspect of rule of law, they succeeded to enter the normative state, but really when they wanted to issue newspapers, they were not allowed because the emergency regulations apply to them. And in the end, their company became just 
uh, company without any action. Then they try to enter another track to the normative law to decide to register themselves as NGO. NGO, as association, they have to put their goals, the political goals. And when they put their national political goals, which based on the criminal Israeli criminal law is legal, Israeli Supreme Court say those national goals against the existence of the state. And by this, they dismiss their petition and they were not registered. And immediately after that case, the Ministry of Defense decided to use the emergency regulation and to outlaw them. But they didn't give up. They tried to enter again the normative uh, law, uh, the normative state, by participating in the election and to run as political party in the Knesset. And the Israel law doesn't prohibit anyone, any citizen, to run to the Knesset. In fact, the base Israeli basic law say that every citizen is entitled to participate in the election, to be elected and to elect. And they ask constitutional protection because the uh, electoral comedy of the state prohibit them to run, although there is no any law that allow this electoral committee to prohibit them. They submit it to the Supreme Court and they say we need constitutional protection. Now the court, and this is considered one of the most important cases in Israeli constitutional law. It's called the Erdor case. The court say, yes, I will apply to you the constitution, Israeli constitutional law. The state constitution is first of all, rely on the values that Israel is a Jewish state for the Jewish people. And in order to participate in the election, you must be loyal to Zionism. And you as Arabs are not loyal to Zionism. They say, but there is no law to prohibit us. And there is no law as loyalty to Zionism. The court said, the values of Israel as Jewish state is above of the rule of law. This aspect of the constitution is what make the state is the state. And if you don't respect that, you cannot run. So this is story uh, which I brought, story about Palestinian citizens of Israel that try to enter the normative track to be protected by the normative track and in the end they found themselves excluded. They wanted all the time to enjoy constitutional protection but when the constitution applied to them it applied to them in order to exclude them. So I think that here what Douglas spoke about the dynamic between the normative state and the bureaucratic state apply in this case. You cannot speak here in this case of the Palestinian state of Israel about strict division between the track of bureaucratic and the track of normative. The case of registering themselves as company was successful, but we know why it's successful. If we read uh, the pages of Douglas in 103, I think, that sometime, and this is what Frankel spoke about it. When you enter the business laws, it's easy to apply a new the normative law because this normative law applied to all the citizens. And the case of the company was like that because the Israeli Supreme Court want to make the business law clear from security reasons because the market is a Jewish market. But you send the Palestinians to the other track, to the emergency track. And uh, this case also show, speak about the success of Frankel. The success of Frankel as a lawyer, they were not really a success. 
like the success of registering the company itself. In the end, even if you succeed in the core, the bureaucratic state enter and cut that. But here the case that I wanted to mention is that also the normative state itself can be exclusive state. The normative state can apply its constitution itself and the constitution can exclude. And I will finish here. I, I, I ended the article that we, uh, in the case of the Palestinian states of Israel, if we want to use the theory of Frankel, we need a campaign to help us here and Schmidt in order to tell us when the court can ad hoc in each case decide on the exception and when it can apply the normative. Unlike the cases that David spoke about and that apply to the West Bank that you have strict division, the problem when you don't have this strict division. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. That was great. Thank you so much. And now uh, I invite David Lubin to speak about uh, lawyer legal sabotage within the state and the conditions that make it possible. Thank you, David. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, I just want to join uh, everyone else in thanking uh, Doug Douglas for writing this fantastic book and uh, Karen for putting together this conference. And uh, I've got to um, mention one particular unexpected pleasure that I got from reading the book. That's something that Douglas and I have corresponded about since when I was brought up with a start to realize that uh, uh, one of uh, Frankel's clients uh, who's written about uh, in pages 68 and 69 is my wife's great aunt, um, who uh, was one of the communist women in prison who was charged with leaving, leading an uprising. Um, where, you know, of course, my first reaction was, well, you go, girl. Uh, and uh, I think that um, there was a second family connection we discovered as well. Um, this, uh, this strikes me as possibly the reason that Frankel was representing uh, Recha Rothschild was that uh, his law partner, Franz Neumann's first wife, was my wife, is my wife's aunt, I'm late aunt. Um, Aunt Lou um, was a very uh, um, tough lawyer who then ended up as a French teacher in uh, Topeka, Kansas. Uh, now, the, the, the issue that I wanted to talk about was uh, whether it's possible to perform legal sabotage within the state. Uh, this is an issue that uh, came, came to the forefront of my consciousness after the Donald Trump victory when uh, um, I have students who were uh, on their way into the Justice Department who were asking themselves, can I do this? Can I go into a Trump Justice Department? Um, I, I knew lawyers within, uh, uh, um, within various federal agencies who were wondering, uh, uh, can I stay in the government um, or must I leave the government or alternatively, must I stay and try to perform legal sabotage, um, also known as upholding the rule of law in this case, uh, also, uh, you know, also known as participating in the deep state. Um, uh, ben Witties, the uh, who runs the Lawfare blog, uh, told me that he got hundreds of emails from people in the same situation. I personally have some conservative friends who were approached by the Trump administration and thought were wondering whether they could morally go in. Now, what's the question here? Um, the the question is, uh, can you become uh, if if you go into the state? you run the risk of becoming a desk perpetrator. Um, can you also be a desk mitigator by going in the state? And if you can, um, how do you do it? And uh, must you stay? Uh, you know, you know, must you stay in the job then in order to become a desk mitigator? And what happens if the only way that you stay in the loop and stay in the job is also to be a desk perpetrator in part of your time? Uh, and you know, the, I'm uh, I, uh, a student of uh, 
uh, a scholar, I should say, of Hannah Arendt, who had very strong views that you never go for the lesser evil, that uh, you, you just get out because if you stay, you are going to be corrupted and you're going to turn into a desk perpetrator. Um, and that I thought was a, a very plausible explanation, a very plausible conjecture, I should say. Um, and my, my wife told me that I was out of my mind, that uh, of course people needed to stay in the government um, and try to do what they could to mitigate. Um, so I, I, the way I wanted to study this was uh, to look at a pair of lawyers who were in the Third Reich, uh, who both laid claims to, and I think truthful claims to being desk mitigators. Um, and, uh, I, and I just wanna take my time to just describe a bit about their careers because they are utterly different from each other. Uh, the first was a man named uh, Bernhard Lusner. Now, Bernhard Lusner um, was uh, a Nazi party member since 1930. He was a reserve stormtrooper. I believe that he was clearly an ideological Nazi in, um, in all but certain respects. Um, he, was, uh, he worked in the Ministry of Justice where his post was the Judenreferent. Uh, he was the expert on Jewish matters. And uh, he appears in the history books because he was one of the drafters of the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, his claim was that uh, he was uh, working during the drafting of the Nuremberg Laws to make them apply to as few people as possible by narrowing the definition of who was a Jew. And uh, um, he said in his post-war memoir, where there's a lot of question about how much of this is truth and how much of it is uh, um, a, an attempt to make himself uh, you know, look less culpable, he said, uh, I regarded them as an outrage every minute of the two days it took to draft them. But he thought that he was fighting against the party radicals. And he claims that his successful fights saved somewhere between 20,000 and 100,000 people um, uh, he had many legal battles um, uh, over the years while he was the Juden referent. I mean, one that uh, you know particularly registered with me um, in, in connection with the Trump administration was that he said that he was able to keep a, a, a racial a question of racial identity out of the German census, which of course was uh, um, an issue that uh, was litigated in the United States. Um, now, the rest of his story is this. So he said that as conditions got worse and worse, his personal danger became worse and worse as he became known in the ministry as a friend of the Jews. Um, but he stayed in until uh, um, 1941 when a word came to him of uh, the Rumbula Forest Massacre outside Riga. Uh, and at that point, he asked for a transfer. Uh, 15 months later, he was able to transfer out of his job into a, a more anodyne job. Uh, the finale was that after the July 20th uh, bomb plot, um, he and his wife sheltered um, a fugitive who was being hunted. And uh, he ended up in prison and had the war not ended, he probably would have uh, been in front of the people's court and probably been executed. Uh, now, um, what, what was interesting about the way that he saw himself is um, that he was a representative of the normative state and saw himself that way. Um, and part of his self vindication is, uh, and I'm gonna quote him here, the completely hellish form of the persecution of the Jews in later years became horrible reality, not as a result of, but rather despite the Nuremberg laws. Uh, and he calls this a simple statement of objective fact. Uh, and what he meant was this, uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, there were officials running wild and applying the anti-Jewish persecutory measures to people who were not Jews according to the Nuremberg laws. And uh, he wrote commentaries and law review articles uh, in which he was insisting that nobody could be counted as a Jew who the Nuremberg laws didn't count as a Jew. And that's, that was uh, the basis. But of 
But he also says in his retrospective memoir uh, that uh, he was completely defeated by, he didn't use the term obviously, he, by the prerogative state um, all along. Um, and uh, uh, nevertheless, I, the way that I had diagnosed him was that he had, that he didn't really believe in the prerogative state in some way that, that he thought, uh, he had a, a, um, a kind of fairy tale faith in the rule of law of the normative state. Um, and that, you know, this was, uh, this was what he was staying on board for. But the question of course is, uh, should he have stayed on board given what he was doing with the rest of his time as the Udno referent. Now the second lawyer uh, is very different. This is um, somebody who's much more famous, uh, Helmut James von Moltke, um, the, uh, who is uh, um, an aristocrat. Uh, the name you might, uh, you might know because of military history because uh, um, he is, uh, I think he was a great uncle and great great uncle were both chief of staff of the German army and it mattered a lot to his subsequent safety um, that uh, he had this one of the most celebrated military names in Germany. Uh, he was an aristocrat. Um, he ha had an English connection uh, on his mother's side. Uh, his grandfather was the Chief Justice of South Africa at one point. Um, he described himself as having socialist leanings. Um, he was devoutly Christian with, and uh, um, and he was the uh, one of the principal organizers of uh, one of the famous resistance circles, the Kreisau Circle, which uh, was meeting during the war to plan what a post-Hitler Germany would look like. Um, uh, his legal specialty in private practice was international business law, but uh, we find him saying that it's it's really impossible um, to do to to do legal, I mean, he doesn't say legal sabotage, even to do law in this state. He writes in 1939 to his grandfather, it is torturing me because in my profession, one cannot help aiding those whose spirit is governing this country. Uh, to do international business transactions, you do nothing but network and bribe. He said, uh, and he uses the term derogatory of one's mind and conscience. No person with self-respect could agree to act under such conditions unless he's forced to do so under the stress of making a living uh, coute que coute. Uh, and he ends up joining uh, the legal department of military intelligence, the Abwehr, um, which turned out to be a happy choice for him because the Abwehr was one of the nests of, oddly enough, resistance. Um, he, uh, um, his job it was um, trying to make sure that there was compliance. I mean, and make sure has to go in very heavy quotes, compliance with the laws of war. And uh, uh, we have a very full volume of his uh, uh, correspondence with his wife about um, the meetings, the issues, and uh, this is all fairly well documented, um, that sometimes he finds himself being the only the only one arguing for a legal position in front of a room of 24 skeptics because he is arguing against a Fuhrer order. But he says, but I managed to win the battle by going over their heads after I was outvoted and talking to the Admiral. And today we have won. More often he lost his battles. And uh, at one point he says to somebody uh, um, that, uh, um, uh, if you, you know, if you want to have any success at all, don't come and work with us. Um, he is eventually jailed. And then after the July 20th bomb plot, um, uh, the Kreisau circle gets unraveled by the Gestapo. He's brought before the people's court uh, and executed. Uh, he was uh, somebody who, uh, um, the diplomat George Kennan, who knew him before the US entered the war, described as morally the greatest person I met on uh, either side of the lines in World War II. Um, now, he was somebody who fully rep uh, recognized the prerogative state early on. 1934, he writes, the old jurisprudence I learned based on an abstract concept of justice and humanity is only of historical interest today. 
So this is 1934, 1939. This is in a personal letter to his friend and colleague, Harry Michaelis. A 1939, a system of government which is placed into the hands of officials of every grade, the power to give decisions on grounds of expediency, uncontrolled and uncontrollable by any impartial person, open to influences of various and dubious kinds. And nevertheless, he is trying to uphold something of the normative state. Uh, uh, well, I mean, more than that, the spirit of international law, which the normative state is not particularly friendly to, um, you know, from within uh, the bowels of the beast. Now, um, the issues that, um, that really interested me or came to interest me were partly what motivates people like this. Um, uh, you know, how do you keep, you know, how do you keep your own moral compass pointed in the right direction? Um, when you are working in uh, that kind of environment where uh, the, the temptation of groupthink uh, or of trying to, trying to save your own effectiveness, uh, the effectiveness trap, as it's sometimes called, is always there. Uh, and second, how do you do this without losing your job or losing your neck? Uh, so the, here the, the concept that um, uh, came to the, that I began to think about was something that I had learned. Um, so this is more than 40 years ago. I spent a few days with a, a, um, an elderly philosopher who had been an old Nazi. Um, before that, he had been a liberal. Uh, he had gotten denounced by Heidegger to the Gestapo and to keep his job, he joined the party. But uh, uh, he was writing his memoir um, and it was uh, called Spielraum. Unter Hitler. I uh, was never, as far as I know, never published. I think he died before finishing it. A uh, Spielraum is wiggle room, essentially. It's tolerance, is the way he put it, tolerance in the engineering sense um, of uh, how much is your permissible deviation. How far, and this is something that it's pretty clear from Doug, Douglas's book that uh, um, Frankel was very careful about his own Spielraum of preserving it as long as he could and then bailing out when there was no more Spielraum. Uh, the way that he did it was by maneuvering to keep his law license, by not representing communists, um, by playing in the normative state as long as he could, by taking the awful risk of trusting that his clients would not rat him out to the Gestapo. Uh, and at some places playing fast and loose with the ethics rules. Uh, um, which I, I think is, uh, as a legal ethics teacher, these were parts of, uh, of Douglas's book that I found particularly interesting was uh, on his, uh, Frankel's attitude toward, the pro toward professional ethics and toward what it is to be a political lawyer. Um, now, uh, the Spielraum, wh what was interesting to me about Lisner and Moltke was that uh, they actually had enough Spielraum to operate. Uh, the reason that uh, Moltke gets uh, executed is because of his extracurricular activities in the Kreisau circle, not because he is arguing for normative state and, uh, and supranormative state values in, uh, in the, the framework of, um, of military, of the Abwehr. Um, but uh, even so, each of them is, um, it keeps on running up into the limits that the prerogative state is imposing. And I think that that leaves the moral dilemma of to stay or to quit um, you know, very much alive. Uh, the, the last thing I wanna say is that uh, for what struck me about both Molka and Lösner is that the reason that they were able to get Spielraum was because um, they had allies in the office, and both of them talk about that. If, they, if it was not possible to have allies in the office, they wouldn't have been able to accomplish anything. And then it's pretty clear that the only solution to the moral dilemma is to bail out of the job. But um, with allies, there's the possibility of actually making more maneuvering or more wiggle room for yourself to conduct legal, legal sabotage. And so the, you know, I think, so the issues I would like to put on the table are, uh, you know, first, what, uh, you know, what are the inner resources that the legal saboteur has to bring in order to, uh, in order to keep operating in such an incredibly host hostile environment?
Um, and second, what are the conditions um, the, that will create and maintain Spielraum uh, in which it can operate? And is there anything that they can do to increase their own Spielraum? So I think I'll just stop there. Thank you, David. Thanks so much. And uh, now we'll hear Inga Markovic, uh, who will speak about the institutional context, uh, the conditions of the normative state in Nazi Germany and its contribution, if any, to legal sabotage. Thank you, Inga. Well, it's a terrific book, book and I learned a lot from it. Uh, I would have given it another name though, not legal sabotage, but legal heroism. And here's why. Uh, there are two strands of thought running through it, a personal one and an institutional one. Uh, the personal one is closer to the author's heart because he's, he himself works as a lawyer who tried to find justice for the down and out. And so uh, the book, he's clearly, the book has clearly a hero. That hero is Frankel. And uh, one is very impressed reading the book about his extraordinary intelligence and discipline and courage and di diplomacy and his abilities to do as much as he can for his, for, for his clients. The institutional is Frankel's dual state analysis. And Frankel operates at the time when he's still in Germany uh, under this, under the conditions of a, a normative state, which is about to disappear swallowed up by the prerogative state. Frankel needs the tools of the normative state. He's a lawyer. He needs the courts. He needs the regular courts. The regular courts were already abolished in Nazi Germany in 19, well, many, not they were not abolished, but, but uh, that was with the institution of the special courts and especially the Volksgerichtshof in 1934. Uh, the, basically the prerogative state began to swallow up the, the normative state. And so Frankel, uh, is less and less able to he, he help his clients. He tries to help his clients basically by pulling a dispute away from the prerogative state into the normative state. And the, and the uh, old cheese case is a very good example where his client is sentenced to prison, but much better off than if he had been in a special court where he had, could, could not appeal and could not, had basically would be, uh, uh, you know, end, end up in concentration camp. <laughs> and so with his tools shrinking, uh, Franco decides he can no longer do his work, apart from the fact that his life in this danger, and he leaves to for the United States in 38 and writes the dual state and now gives us the analysis on, about which we're now talking. Now, um, uh, what Frankel had done was not really sabotage. He could not systematically attack uh, the prerogative state with the help of normative state instruments. He could help individual clients. And he realized that uh, the, his normative instruments and tools and talents were no match for Hitler's prerogative state. Uh, uh, Douglas, um, at least is the way I read this book, uh, suggests that uh, Frankel was not opposed to uh, the coup of uh, July 20th, 1944. Uh, Bec and because he would have agreed that bomb, a bomb is a better way of dealing with Hitler than a lawsuit. Uh, and uh, well, the, the a traditional life coup failed, but eventually Hitler was vanquished by the bombs of the allies. So um, uh, he was a hero, but not the kind of hero which could have seriously threatened the, normative, the, the prerogative state. Uh, there is a scene in a Bre Brecht's play, Life of Galileo, in which towards the end of the play, where somebody says, unhappy the land that has no heroes. And Galileo answers, unhappy the land that needs heroes. Uh, there were no, not many he legal heroes in the Third Reich. After 1933, after Hitler had both uh, 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 gotten rid of uh, uh, the, the uh, liberal Jewish or both uh, uh, people of the judiciary and uh, uh, Jewish uh, lawyers could no longer work. Uh, basically, pretty much all legally trained people uh, submitted to him. <clears throat> uh, the judges did not particularly like Hitler, he was vulgar, etc. But after they saw from where the wind blew, 
most of them joined uh, the party. Uh, law professors bent over backwards to write things which were please Hitler. Uh, attorneys, you know, they were, I don't know, we don't know much about what went on in the normal state. Uh, we know uh, much more about uh, the prerogative state under Hitler, uh, but they all, most of all, virtually all of them cooperated. There were very few legal heroes. Uh, uh, David uh, 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 mentioned two of them, the book is, uh, if, uh, covers them, and so on. Uh, so, um, uh, what uh, uh, towards the end of the, uh, it, it took the West after the war, it took the West German legal story a while to sort of admit what had been going on in the, in the Nazi judiciary. Uh, after 1945, after the East German state, GDR, and the West German state, the Federal Republic had been established, the GDR kicked out all its Nazis. Uh, uh, kicked out all its uh, law professors had been in the, in the party and tried to replace them by people who had, by jurors who had kept a clean vest, and then by educating their old socialist uh, jurors who could replace them. West Germany, uh, uh, after 1949, uh, basically released all the few 12, I think 11 or 12, uh, Nazi uh, war, legal war criminals, which had been sentenced by in, the, in the Nuremberg trials from prison. Uh, Schlegelberger, who had been a life prison, uh, uh, basically retired actually to my hometown, Flensburg, and received a pension for the rest of his life. Um, and in 1951, uh, the German, the Federal Republic in integrated almost all the legal staff of the Third Reich into the West German court system. Uh, the judges, uh, the prosecutors, all law professors, with the exception of Al Schmidt, regained their professorships. Many judges, actually, even judges of the Volksgerichtshof, continued as judges in the Federal Republic. Um, so, uh, post where well, it, it took it took uh, German uh, post war historians a while to really see these facts and be upset about them. Uh, uh, the, 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 there, there was not much writing, really, until at least for a generation. Uh, the uh, and when uh, the Nazi uh, uh, judiciary came to the attention of German historians, it was mostly the, uh, uh, the jurists from the prerogative state. Uh, most of you will have seen Ingmar Müller's Furchtbare Juristen. Uh, I think it's in English, it's called Hitler's Justices. Um, uh, uh, but for a long time, uh, in with you know, considering that West Germany basically uh, was uh, West German judicial system was basically run was run by ex Nazis in the 1970s. Uh, something like three quarters of the judges of the BGH, the Bundesgerichtshof, had already judges under Hitler. Uh, some of them under the Weimar Republic, a few even under the uh, under the Emperor. Uh, the, the general assumption was that the judges of the of the special courts uh, were. Uh, had to be condemned, but the judges of the ordinary courts had so had kept a clean vest, clean heads, um, uh, because they had not done they had dealt with political issues. Uh, that after Ingo Müller's, um, well, probably before, because uh, it must have started before, but in the late eighties, the notion that the ordinary judges had kept had kept clean hands was begin beginning to be attacked by a number of scholars who looked empirically at what German ordinary courts actually had been doing in the Third Reich. Uh, there was a, the best book of them, I think, is a book by Rainer Schröder, which appeared in uh, 1988, I think, uh, under the ironic title, Aber im Zivilrecht sind die Richter standhaft geblieben. In civil law and private law, the judges kept, uh, uh, kept basically uh, 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 honest and, and, and bedfast. And he uh, investigated uh, the, uh, a particular court district, in this case, the, the case law of, the, uh, of, a, of an appellate court in Celle, uh, looking at all the cases it had decided between 1933 and 1945. Hmm. And he found that, no, the, the ordinary judges, that is Hitler's judges of the, of the shrinking normative state in the Third Reich had not had clean hands, that there were a lot of really disgusting Nazi sentences that he found. And similar case, similar empirical studies followed uh, in 2000, a study of the uh, 
uh, Fairbury and divorce courts in Hamburg and Hamburg Altona in, 19, in 2000, I think, or 2000, no, so 2012, a study of the, of the repeal court in, in, in Köln and Cologne. And they found the same thing, that they, they found a lot of uh, obvious Nazi uh, decisions which showed that the judges, as we knew who had all joined the party, who had been Nazis. But there was a problem with these empirical studies. The problem was that they were empirical, but they were all qualitative rather than quantitative. That is, uh, 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 Schroeder in his study about uh, the court, uh, uh, the uh, court of appeals in Celle, had gone through all the decisions of that court, but had picked for his book uh, those cases which he called exemplary. The exemplary cases were those which looked particular, particular Nazi verbiage, Nazi uh, arguments, who were clearly visible Nazi, uh, national socialists. Uh, the problem was these cases made up only about 5% of the court's case law. Uh, similar in the, with the empirical studies of other court districts, they made up even less. They made up between three, four, 5% of the court's case law. So it looks like 95% of the case law of the of the uh, normative courts, the ordinary courts under Hitler, which incidentally the case law dropped terrifically from 1933 to 1939. I don't have later the figures because uh, I couldn't find statistics, uh, but people litigated less and less. But 95% of these cases were seem to be following the law. Uh, <coughs> They, they produced something which under the current law was justice. Uh, they were, uh, uh, they seem to be uh, written by lawyers who try to keep clean hands by possibly positives. It's, we, must, we must remember that Douglas tell us, tells us that the normative law of the Nazi years, of course, was not all Weimar. Weimar law was shrinking. It was a combination of Weimar and new Nazi law. But that law, it looked, was treated with respect by the lawyers in the ordinary courts under the civil right. So uh, uh, how can that be? Uh, how can it be that uh, Nazi lawyers, we know who well, most of them were Nazis, who could write actually disgusting uh, uh, decisions, in most of the cases kept honest in the eyes of the law, even the bad law. Uh, it maybe explains something why these lawyers could all be taken over by the Federal Republic in, uh, after 1949. Uh, they were Nazis, uh, but they, have, they obviously were also proper lawyers. Uh, the, 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 my explanation is that law, even bad law, is a dangerous institution, even for dictatorships, because law uh, has a language in people which people can defend itself. It has concepts which people can use to make their arguments. It has a forum in which people can try to defend their rights. It has a profession which they can uh, turn to if they need help. That is even bad law uh, is better than Totally arbitrary. Every even even Nazi even the Nazi law of the time were better uh, than than uh, the uh, the prerogative state, which you know eventually swallowed up uh, the the normative state in the Nazi years. Now the normative state in the Nazi years could not do anything to prevent uh, the collapse of uh, Nazi Germany. It was a very short reign, twelve years. And from the very beginning, it kept running towards the abyss, I think, essentially. So, uh, but that may mean that uh, these proper legal uh, lawyers uh, might have been useful in another dictatorial system, which was less uh, uh, bloodthirsty than the Nazi one. Uh, if the, and, and it explains why all these Nazi judges taken over by the Federal Republic could create by today, something which is a very respectable rule of law. While the, while the East German people's judges, which were kicked out uh, if they had Nazi connections and were, were hired uh, because they were not Nazis, uh, under socialist conditions, took a long time 
to produce something which came closer to the kind of courts which we, which we might recognize as legitimate courts. Uh, basically, it suggests that a dictatorship run with law is a preferable uh, 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 dictatorship than a preferable dictatorship without law. And it suggests something not for the Nazis, but it suggests something for uh, other dictatorships like my specialty, East Germany, for instance. In East Germany, which started out with a uh, prerogative state, and over the 40 years which existed, developed something which came more and more in the direction of a normative state. Uh, basically, Frankel's, uh, Frankel's uh, description, which applies to the Third Reich, uh, shows uh, 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 a, a, a sort of a, a both sides are sort of penetrable by each other. In, in the Third Reich, the, the prerogative state uh, swallowed up the normative state. What happened in East Germany is by and by that the normative state actually made inroads into the prerogative state. Um, so even bad law is better than no law. I'm, by the way, not the only one who says so. Uh, if you think of E.P. Thompson's Wigs and Hunters, in which he describes the origin of the Black Acts, he uh, also, by reading numerous, numerous files of what happened in England during the Black Acts, comes to decision. There's a famous quote from Wigs and Hunters, uh, for which he got a lot of, lot of trouble by his, he was a communist, Thompson was a communist by his communist colleagues, was basically the rule of law is an, un, is an unquest, unqualified human good. He uses rule of law and not in, uh, in a dubious sense, he's not, Thompson was not a lawyer, he uses it basically in the meaning of a view by law. A rule of law, of course, is technical term, which means that also the state is set, uh, cast to submit to the law. But anyway, um, uh, so, uh, and I just want to tell you one case, which is an example, because it shows how even horrible law under the Nazis can be protected. It's a case I ran into by the study of East German, uh, the law faculty of Humboldt University under the, under the, the years of socialism. Uh, uh, we will have to cut you short. One, one story, which will take three minutes. Uh, yeah. It was, there was a lot, there was a, 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 a judge in Berlin, half Jewish, who, uh, uh, who was kicked out in 1933 by Hitler. He managed to survive the Third Reich by teaching crap calls to lawyers. He became an early law professor uh, under, at the Humboldt University in East Berlin. Um, anyway, he in 1940 was uh, denounced by a neighbor because he apparently harbored a Jewish woman in his flat and was violating the unspeakable law on the protection of German blood and German honor which uh, uh, had been written by, what's his name, Lersner, uh, or contributed by Lersner. Uh, he take, took his own case in his own hands and he could prove, because he was a man with a lot of chutzpah, incidentally also connection with the Kaiser Kreis, he took his case in his own hands and could prove on the basis of marriage licenses and birth records that he was half Jewish. And so he could not violate the law of the protection of German blood and German honor. His blood as a half Jew was already sullied by his half Jewishness. The prosecutor dropped the case. We don't know why. Maybe he was happy not to apply a disgusting law. Maybe he was get gay, happy about being in some extra time. Maybe he was annoyed by losing to a Jew, Jew. But even bad law is better than no law. And so uh, I think on the whole, a state is better off with a legal system when then with occasionally legal heroes, which will find it very difficult to fight against the uh, prerogative state. Thank you so much, Inga. And I'd like to invite uh, Jens Meyer, Meyer Henry. Henry. Uh, he's our last speaker. Jens will speak about Franz Neumann, uh, his behemoth, and uh, all that in relation to Frankel and the dual state. Thank you, Jens. And thank you for being so patient and waiting till the end. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. And let me also start by saying I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. And I'm delighted um, that uh, we are celebrating the uh, publication of Douglas's book. Um, Douglas, I should mention, was very kind when I was in the final stages of writing uh, my book on Franco. Um, and he provided me with uh, 
almost 10,000 words of very constructive comments. And I'm, I'm delighted that now his book is out as well and is a terrific uh, contribution to the scholarship. And, and I like to think that our books are, are, are complementary in, in various respects. And as numerous speakers have pointed out, he did a terrific job on uh, shining a bright light on Frankel's legal practice, uh, which is something we, we didn't know much about up until now. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and, and to celebrate um, this terrific achievement. Um, I think what I might do, given uh, time constraints, uh, I'm sort of going to pick up a couple of themes and tie them together um, and uh, sort of set aside some of the other remarks I had prepared. And maybe jumping off of Inga's comments just now, um, I'm not quite sure I would be quite as categorical as saying that than any um, law um, and driven regime is inherently preferable to one that isn't. But I think um, the larger issue speaks to some um, a question that Douglas had raised, um, namely, uh, and it came out in, in, in Lauren's, um, Lauren's comments as well, whether perhaps dual states are everywhere. Um, and I do believe they are everywhere, uh, but I don't think that all states are dual states. Um, and sort of in, in answer to some of Inga's comments and, and David kindly alluded to this, David Dysonhaus that is, kindly alluded to this project that he is part of and, and John Ferrigon is a part of and, and now Douglas Morris as well, namely a, a book that's coming out next year called Dual States, A Global History. Um, because I, I do believe there is value in, in taking Frankel and the concept of the dual state as a heuristic, um, in order to see whether or not there are similar relationships between lawlessness and legality, or as, as I have sort of paraphrased Frankel, between a state that is primarily centered on decisionism, if you want to bring in Schmidt as, as Hassan is, is keen to do, um, and another part of the state that is driven primarily by commitment to legalism. I think this heuristic that, that sort of Frankel effectively introduced is worthwhile to think with in an ideal typical fashion and sort of this is the book that um, that that we've put together it's coming out next year is trying to do um, and I think it does help um, to see whether or not reality shapes up uh, or how it holds up to this imaginary standard um, and I think the case that Hassan made for for talking about Palestine bears out the utility of thinking with this concept even if we find in the end that what we have in, uh, in front of us is not really a dual state um, the way perhaps Frankel defined it or, or others did but nonetheless by applying this heuristic we might understand better the multiple ways in which um, um, law contributes to both democracy and dictatorship, to liberalism as well as illiberalism. And I think that's sort of the, the value that I see in, in, in Frankel's book. And let me here sort of make the swerve perhaps to, um, to Neumann. Um, but before I do that very quickly, um, I sort of, David Dysonhaus also kindly mentioned my, my first book on South Africa, where the dual state is, is sort of the key concept around uh, which my argument is, is built. And I've traced over time, basically, the interacting effects, the changing relationships there between the normative state and the prerogative state. Um, and it, I think it's quite valuable to, to, to see whether this concept travels. Uh, and I think in our contemporary time, um, there's even more uh, value in this. Um, but what's interesting about um, Franklin Neumann is this. And so if you go to Barnes & Noble or uh, Borders or at any uh, large bookstore in the US in the Nazi section, the Third Reich section, you will invariably find Franz Neumann's behemoth. There's always a behemoth on the shelf. There has been for decades. Um, and this is the reason why I, for example, in my book, devote an entire chapter to Behemoth, because I think, and this goes to the question of the policy relevance here as well, that was sort of alluded to in a couple of the comments. Um, because I think analysis and prescription have to go together. And what's interesting about Behemoth, Behemoth and Franz Neumann, Franz Neumann, as Douglas mentioned, was Anne Frank's law partner in Berlin. Um, he fled the Nazi dictatorship in 1933 already because his life was in danger. Um, he did a second PhD at the LSE, my current home institution, and then eventually found his way um, to the US. Now, Behemoth uh, came out um, a year after 
the dual state and very quickly superseded in the American and international reception the impact of the dual state. Now, I believe this was detrimental to our understanding of Nazi dictatorship and has been detrimental for decades, especially in, in popular parlance. Because the argument that Neumann makes is that the regime, the Nazi regime, was effectively lawless. And he arrives at this conclusion based on a particular understanding of what law is. Now, this brings us to Radbruch, whom Lawrence Douglas, Douglas mentioned earlier as well, um, and also to the post-war dispensation in Germany. Because what's interesting here is that even though the German federal constitutional court tried to work for years with the Radbruch formula, um, it eventually in the 50s and later in 1980 found uh, and I have the quote here, it found that it would be um, that we had, that the court had to accept the facticity of statutory lawlessness. So in order to adjudicate some of the cases coming out of the so-called Third Reich, the court had to acknowledge that even though something that we might want to call law effectively was law. And it used the term a sociological understanding of law was required. And I think this is really quite interesting because it runs counter to the argument that Neumann developed in Behemoth, where he denied the existence of law because law was devoid um, of moral content. And I think this brings me back to the, to the contemporary discussion, namely um, how to understand um, legal authoritarianism, constitutional authoritarianism, authoritarian legalism. There's many different combinations of terms out there because it seems to me um, we misunderstand potentially one um, particular logic of rule, the logic through, by, with law. If we uh, are too obsessed with the, perhaps the moral content of that law, because, and, and, and this is perhaps another point worth making. I'm not suggesting, and this goes to Inga's point, that law-driven regimes are inherently preferable or better. They actually may be more dangerous because they're better at concealing the violence at the heart of this regime. And I think that's what's so interesting about the concept of the dual state. And as Douglas pointed out in his opening remarks, and I will, I will end on, on this note, uh, as he pointed out uh, quite eloquently, uh, for Franco, there wasn't anything inherently desirable uh, morally desirable, normatively desirable about the dual state. However, he did realize that as a strategic resource, the dual state um, was important to him for the uh, for acts of legal sabotage, perhaps. But also, it is important to understand properly the logic of violence in the regime in which he was living, in order to think about realistic consequences. And Neumann, unfortunately, became highly influential in the Office of Strategic Services in the US and influenced prescription and policy vis-a-vis -vis Nazi Germany that effectively were founded on an entirely inadequate analysis of how that regime actually hang together. And I think that kind of relationship um, is, is worth thinking more about. And that's why I want to talk about Neumann, because I believe um, the juxtaposition of Neumann's work and Frankel's work uh, sheds bright light on the questions we face today. Thank you, Jens, and, and thank you, everyone, uh, for being so patient. It did take a longer time than we expected, and I do, and, and, and I, I think we, so many things came up today, and um, there is still a lot to discuss, um, and I, but I want to, and we can't go beyond the time limit, but I want to let Douglas uh, respond or say some few words before we, we end. But maybe before that, I just want to mention uh, that in the comments, uh, you can have a look at the chat. There were some questions regarding the practical implications. Uh, Alvin was asking about the Hong Kong uh, case and, try, and asked to uh, put some focus on, 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 on that case, uh, which is very much alive and uh, dangerous and scary. Um, and other, other topics that came up and we won't have time to discuss uh, them. Uh, some of the issues are uh, uh, the fact that, that uh, Frankel was a socialist and this didn't really come up much in the discussion. What will be the implications of that, uh, especially when we think about law in our context and also the issue of the, the global or international law aspect of this. We are here at the ILJ 
uh, uh, forum and which is the in Institute for International Law and Justice. And uh, today when there is this uh, uh, move uh, from different directions of, of different states becoming more authoritarian and making uh, and coalitions of authoritarian states as opposed to uh, coalitions of more liberal constitutional states and whether does that mean to the international legal system and to the uh, to thinking about law this came up in the book as well uh, we didn't discuss it uh, there's also the issue that did come up a few times in the discussion but we didn't focus on which is the colonial and post-colonial context which came up in in, in Hassan's talk but also a little bit in in, in Benjamin Het's talk and the idea the, the, this uh, thought of the Colum the, the um, Cambodian case, uh, and and and, and I'm, I'm just raising all this because there's so much to discuss and we won't have time for it, but I want to give uh, Douglas the last uh, final words and uh, ask you to join us for the next events uh, of the ILJ uh, uh, History and Theory of International Law uh, workshops. So Douglas, please. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Um, obviously, there were so many brilliant comments uh, that just came rattling off. It's impossible to wrap up in two or three minutes. Uh, let me just say uh, this, that uh, the dual state was written uh, between 1936 and 1938 at a moment of desperation. Uh, it was written at a time that the Gestapo and the Nazi regime had uh, basically crushed the uh, early resistance, in which uh, Frankel saw that his hopes for socialist resistance was not uh, viable, uh, where he saw that his options were being cut off. And it's at that point that he uh, went to work on this analysis of the Nazi regime uh, in the hope of understanding that regime and in the hope of uh, trying to find some uh, basis uh, for uh, continued resistance against that regime in one form or another. One of the bases that he found for that uh, resistance uh, was an idea which hasn't come up uh, directly here, which is the idea of natural law, uh, which was an unexpected concept for a, a Marxist to uh, turn to. Uh, he turned to it as a way in the hope of unifying a larger resistance. Uh, I, and I think that's also important because uh, in uh, most discussion of uh, German law in the 20th century, uh, it uh, revolves around what Radbrook said after the war, uh, in which I think Radbrook misinterpreted what happened during the Nazi regime, uh, in which uh, he uh, alleged that it was a question of uh, judges being uh, positivist, when in fact the problem was the judges were political and went along with the uh, regime and were happy to do that for the most part. Uh, it was at this point that uh, Frankel uh, turned to the idea of natural law, of, of law outside of statutes, uh, where there are uh, fundamental principles that a variety of people uh, could appeal to, uh, including religious people. He developed the idea in discussions with, uh, with a uh, very religious man represented confessing church, Martin Gallagher, a conservative man. Uh, uh, so um, it, it was a moment of desperation, uh, which he wrote this book as part of his uh, continuing resistance, and it's given rise to a uh, political theory, which, uh, as we've seen today, uh, has, is much richer and has much more potential than, quite frankly, I had ever imagined. Um, uh, when I studied it in the context of uh, Nazi Germany. So I wanna thank all of the uh, panelists for really uh, for giving such wonderful presentations. And I again wanna thank uh, Karen and Rachel for putting in all the work for organizing this. Thank you very much. See you next time.